In today's video, I'm gonna share six tips that'll help you improve your wildlife footage while also allowing you to get more consistent results every time you go out. Stay tuned. This video is part one of a two-part series where I'll be talking about filming wildlife. In today's video, it'll be more about in the field tips and tricks. And next week will be more about editing and my workflow while I edit and what I look for. So if you have any questions about the editing process, leave them in the comments down below and I'll address those questions in that video. Let's start with tip number one and that's to use manual focus as much as you can when you're filming wildlife. The rule of thumb that I like to use when I'm doing photography, for example, it's usually 90% of the time I'll be using autofocus, 10% manual. Well, for video, I flip that. 90% of the time I'm trying to use manual focus. And for those really few select times, like the 10% of the time when the animal is moving really fast or I'm trying to track it really quickly, I'll just rely on the autofocus because I know that I won't be able to manually focus as quick to follow it. But for the other times when you have just a bird perched or you have a deer in the field and it's not really moving too much, it might just be foraging, you really don't need to be using autofocus. There's so many elements in the screen like trees, branches, grasses that can distract the autofocus and that's when you start getting that hunting in your footage and it's one of the most distracting things when you're staring at somebody's footage and it's just constantly jumping from trees to leaves to branches. So what I like to do is I have one of my custom function buttons on the top set to autofocus and manual focus switch. So I can easily switch between the two just from the top. And the reason why I prefer that over doing it on the lens itself is because say I'm in the middle of filming something and the animal starts to move and I wanna move over to autofocus, for example, if I have to go to the switch and press it, I'm pretty much guaranteed to get shake in my footage because I need to put pressure to apply it to the switch. Whereas if it's on a button, I find it's a lot easier to press without getting too much shake in your footage. And also when I'm manually focusing, I have two things enabled, which is focus peaking and focus magnification, which is great to just zoom in, see exactly what you're focusing on and know that when you're manually focusing, you're doing it accurately. It's such a great help in the field. So use those settings, try to use manual as much as possible and you're gonna get more consistent results with less auto focus hunting in your footage. Tip number two has helped me get more usable footage throughout the years and that's to keep my camera in slow motion. The reason that's so important is most wildlife observations or interactions last only a few seconds. You'll find the animal, you'll see it before you even get your tripod down sometimes that animal's gone. So the ability to shoot in slow motion increases that time that you're with that animal. So when a bird lands for example and it might only stay there for two or three seconds if I'm filming in real time, I'm only getting two or three seconds out of that interaction. But if I'm filming in slow motion, I'm able to slow that down to possibly 10, 15 seconds. And it really just helps you get more footage and wildlife just looks great in slow motion. So what I'll do usually if I'm just hiking down a trail, I'll have my camera set in slow motion. And then once I get to a bird or an animal and I start filming it, if it's very cooperative, then afterwards I'll switch to 4K and go in regular speed. Just because you wanna mix in a variety of different types of footage from regular speed and slow motion. Another great benefit to using slow motion is when you're tracking a subject, or even if your camera's sitting on a tripod and there might be a bit of shaking, it definitely reduces the jitters or the shakes that you get in your camera. So it makes your footage look more smooth overall. Tip number three is to to use a zoom lens. Versatility is absolutely key when it comes to filming wildlife. There's kind of a common rule of thumb when you're filming not only wildlife but anything in general is you want a variety of shots. You don't just want extreme close-ups of the animals. You want some wide shots, mid shots, tight shots, and extreme close-ups to really get a full story of the animal's environment and what the animal's doing. If I was using a prime lens, I'd have to move around a lot more to get these different shots. And especially if you're in a blind, you won't be able to move around. So that's why one of the most expensive wildlife lenses on the market is a 50 to 1,000 $70,000 lens. A lot of the behind the scenes of all these nature documentaries, that's one of the main lenses that you see because no matter where you are, if you're stagnant, you're sitting in a blind or a hide or whatever, you're able to zoom out and zoom in as you please and get a variety of different shots. Tip number four is to use in-body crops and zooms to get even closer to your subject. So I use this in a ton of my videos and honestly the quality is still really good. If I was using my Sony 200 to 600 millimeter lens, I can go from a 200 millimeter field of view all the way out to 600 and then with crops and zooms I'm able to get out to about 1300 millimeters of a field of use. A great example is when I was filming that red-headed barbet nest in Ecuador. I just positioned myself in one spot and I just used the different zooms and the different crops to get different angles and different fields of view. So it works great. You don't have to move too much so you're not disturbing your subject and it's just a way to get 
even closer to your subjects without having to really lose much quality or have to disturb them or anything. Definitely use this in conjunction with the zoom lens to get the best results and the most variety of shots that you can get from one spot. Tip number five is to use a tripod and yes it would be nice to not have to lug around a tripod but at the end of the day it's going to get you the most consistent results. There's so many things that you have to think about when you're filming wildlife like composition, keeping your frame steady, keeping the focus on the subject, adjusting settings, zooming in, zooming out. Like there's so many things that you have to think about that when you're handheld it just doesn't always come together. And if you want more consistent footage and you want more footage that's actually usable just use a tripod especially further down the line when you start getting more gear and you're adding external microphones and maybe external monitors, external batteries. And I'm not saying you can't get good footage when you're going handheld but it's really the difference between good footage and better footage. There's a couple other reasons why I like to use tripods but I'll talk about those in the upcoming video when I'm talking about the editing sequence because it'll make a little bit more sense. The next tip is to focus on your sound design. Sound is so important in film, it's what really draws your viewer into the footage. You can have great footage but have really bad audio and that's going to pull your viewers out of that experience. But you can have just decent footage but very very good audio and that's going to bring your viewers in. It's going to make them feel more immersed in that situation. So when it comes to audio, there's a few different routes you can take. The first one is to just record the audio as you're recording the video. So have a microphone plugged into your camera and record video and audio simultaneously. I like doing this when the environment is actually nice. Like there's not a bunch of cars zipping by, there's not planes flying over, people cutting their grass. If there's a lot of nice natural sounds, I like to record the audio simultaneously. And when I'm recording audio like that, I like to clear the area below my feet because sometimes there's branches and grasses and leaves that can add like some crunches and some unwanted noises into the audio. The next thing you can do for audio is to use Foley sounds. So that's just adding sound effects and ambient noises in afterwards. This is usually the preferred method for a lot of big productions because you just want the cleanest, crispest audio possible. And most of the time you're not going to get that while you're filming wildlife simultaneously. It's usually done separately. Sometimes it's not even the same scene that they're getting the audio from. The thing is though, and this is a warning, you need to practice and you need to get good at it. If you're adding in audio and sound effects that don't make any sense, it's really cringy and it pulls your audience out of that footage. My recommendation is when you're adding Foley sounds, don't just add one sound. Really try to build an environment of sounds. So say for example you have an animal walking across a field. If you want to add footsteps to that animal, don't just add footsteps. Add maybe wind in the back, maybe add some birds singing in the background, maybe a river in the distance. Just add and build the environment around that animal and that sound instead of just putting sound of footsteps because that's when it's really noticeable that oh they just added in footsteps in post. The best method in my opinion is to use a combination of these different sources. So use natural sounds, use foley sounds, and use music tracks together to create a really great soundtrack for your footage. So that's all I have for you today. I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions about editing wildlife footage, leave it down below and I'll get to that in part two of this video. Happy birding.